Okay. We have been working on bringing our next speaker to this conference for three years. So, and she's going to be worth waiting for. But now that she's here, we figured the best person to introduce her would be HP's Boise-based Diversity and Inclusion Program Manager and our Diversity Innovation Skill Builder, Trina Finley Ponce. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm honored to have the opportunity to introduce Leslie Slayton Brown this afternoon. Leslie returned to HP Inc. after a short stint away in the fall of 2015 as HP's Chief Diversity Officer, where she has been instrumental in driving a diversity and inclusion strategy that has set the benchmark for embedding diversity and inclusion across all of the organizations in our company starting with driving action to create the most diverse board of directors of any tech company in the United States. I think we're 42% women on our board. So round of applause for Leslie for that. Yeah. Leslie inspires and dr drives leaders to embed diversity and inclusion into everything we do. And she demonstrates impact from the boardroom to the business unit to the individual person. As an agent of change, she has a unique ability to engage leaders at all levels to have difficult conversations about diversity, inclusion, and belonging. Leslie was named the most powerful woman in corporate diversity by Black Enterprise, a woman of the year in technology, and one of the most influential women in corporate America. And we at HP have kind of voted her as all around awesome woman leader. <laughs> Leslie is a very proud graduate of Boise State University. <laughs> and she remains very invested in the university, the Boise community, the Treasure Valley, and the state of Idaho. We at HP know what, it is, what a treat it is to have her here today as a keynote speaker, and we're excited for all of you to learn how awesome she is and the insights that she has to share today. And we're glad that you're here to help us welcome her home today. It is my honor and privilege this afternoon to introduce my mentor, my role model, and my boss, Leslie Slayton Brown. Boise! All right. I just excluded everybody else. That was so undiversity of me. Um, woo wee. Okay. So um, I'm going to be honest with you. So a couple of things. So first of all, it feels so good to be back in Boise. This is home for me. This is my alma mater. This is where literally I grew up. I became an adult. I became a mother. I became a wife. Um, I became a better daughter, a better friend, a better colleague um, because of Boise. Um, I have to tell you though, there's been some great speakers. And in fact, Nancy Hughes, is Nancy still here? Amazing, was she not? Oh my God, I've just got, she just filled me up and re-inspired me with her stories and the fact that you know, she's answering the call of duty. yesterday is really start by expressing my gratitude and honor to the Shoshone Bannock tribes. Um, this land belonged to them 
And I am so pleased that Sally Jewell brought that forth, the acknowledgement of, of that yesterday. Um, I too have adopted that when I go and I speak. I do acknowledge and honor um, the land of which um, I stand on. I also want to bow to my ancestors, my patriarch, my matriarch, um, those who um, I rest on their shoulders. I could not be here, I could not do what I do if I did not have what I had. And so for that, I'm very grateful. I will also say that um, because of them, I'm so fully me. I'm so fully and unapologetically me. You'll get a little bit of flawed Leslie, feisty Leslie, and definitely a fearless Leslie. And I couldn't always say that. And I'm thankful for Boise and for Boise State for creating that fearlessness in me. It's off again. It's too hard to stand in one place. OK, but I'll try to do my best. Um, um, I want to thank Tracy and the Andrus uh, Center for Public Policy for inviting me here. I know it's taken a few years, and I will tell you, at the close of the bell last year, Trina came and said, can you just put it on your calendar, tentative? Just put it on there. So the persistence and the patience, and I'm here, and I'm glad to be here. And I also know about this organization, no is a, not an option. I would also be totally remiss if I didn't acknowledge my wonderful HP colleagues all over there somewhere. <laughs> They're quiet. Hello, HP. <laughs> oh, I'm back there. All right. Good. Um, we're going through a lot right now. We're going through change at HP. We're, do, we're, in the, we're in the process of a changing of the guard. And our CEO has stepped down. He's taking time to go to his home country, which is Australia. He's passing the baton to our president of, of printing, who is stepping up into the CEO position. And the interesting thing about this, so Dion Weisler passing to um, Enrique Lores. Um, Enrique started at HP as an intern. From intern to CEO of a $58 billion company, go figure. Love it. Um, let's see, what else do I get my little thank yous out of the way here? Um, I want to tell a, a quick story, too, about one of the things I'm excited about in this changing of the guard that's happening. On Thursday, when the announcement ma was made that our CEO was stepping down, and in his words, he said, I'm doing what I've always told you all to do, and that's to put family first. So it was a little bit of a shock, a little bit of a surprise. We have to report out to the street. There's a lot of scurrying around that's going on and a lot of angst with folks. And Enrique Lores, who led our print, um, um, print business, um, he, on Sunday, I literally had my phone, Saturday actually working out in the yard. It died, I had it plugged up. I thought it was turned off. And uh, part of it was intentional because I didn't want to get any calls, work calls. And, um, and I got a call just as I was sitting down to dinner with my husband about 6 o'clock. And it was Enrique Lores on the line. And Enrique hails from Barcelona. He has a very strong Spanish accent. And he said to me, he said, hello. And I said, hello. <laughs> and he said, hi, Leslie, this is Enrique. And I said, Enrique Lores? I said, what are you doing calling me? And he said, I just wanted to see how you're doing. And I said, well, what do you mean how I'm doing? And I was thinking, did, and I started kind of flipping through my phone, like, did we lose somebody? You know, I'm kind of in a bit of a panic. And I said, Enrique, I'm fine, how are you? And he said, I didn't call for me, I called to see how you were doing. And I said, well, do you mean like with the change and all of all that's going on? And he said, absolutely, that's exactly what I'm asking about. Um, and I told him, I said, Enrique, I said, I'm really, really sad that Dion is having to leave. I've really enjoyed working with him. He's been a great leader for us. Um, we, we, we were kind of in our stride. And I said, but I'm really excited for you. I couldn't be more prouder of you stepping into this role. I've had the honor of, of for 18 to 24 months touring with him from site to site as the lead of, of our print business. He has gone, he's put together this reinvent um, um, uh, 
kind of road show, if you will, to go from major site to major site to site to site to site and to share the, the HP strategy, to talk about what his what his focus is and what his priorities are and where he lies as a, as a leader. And literally he did this fake match.com profile on himself of what his strengths are or what his weaknesses are. No, no kidding. And he, um, and he went on to talk about culture and diversity and growth mindset and the importance of what that means to HP as a company and how when we can have an open and a speak up culture that we all do better as a result of it. How when diversity is at the table, we have better innovation, we're more creative. Do we still have more work to do? Absolutely. But was he on the right track of what he was trying to do? He also would meet with every single employee resource group or what we call business impact network, which is a, common, a combination of, of affinity groups. And he would meet with them, whether it was the black employee network or the women's impact network or, <clears throat> excuse me, our multicultural network or veterans or people with disabilities. He would sit down and he would listen to them. He would talk to, talk to them. And I was always fearful when he came back because there was this long list of things of go do this, go do this, go do this. And no was not an option. It was we're going to make this a better place. And, you know, I mean, we have a wonderful and thriving print business, but quite honestly, it's a good old boys network. And so when we did the research and he found the results of that and it, and it said we're still doing that, he said, I want to talk to all of my employees. I want to talk to people because I want to make a difference in what we're trying to do around culture and growth mindset and um, diversity and inclusion. And by the way, he took the initiative to make sure that his own leadership was building. You know, we're, we're still building, but we saw women in leadership positions, and when women in leadership positions make, and they're good, make great decisions, they bring others along. And so we were, we were having those conversations, and we said, well, that's not good enough. We're, not, we're still not seeing you know, some ethnic diversity changes. And so we started working through that, and we started having conversations about intersectionality, of it's one thing to be a woman, it's another thing to be a woman of color or a woman um, from the LGBTQ community or with a disability. And, and so we were having those conversations. So I will say this, and I will say this to my HP colleagues out there, I think we're in good hands. I know, we're, we're, I know that we're going through some changes. Businesses change. We, you upsize, downsize, right size, whatever the, 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 you know, the, the language is um, for the time. But I really do feel like we're in good hands. We're in the hands of somebody that has grown up in the company, somebody that cares deeply for the people and for the culture. And because of that, that means that that impacts our Boise community as well. Diversity at the, at the corporate level impacts at the community level as well. And so um, we are in good hands. All right, so now with that, I want to tell you a little bit about me, and it's going to kill me to stand right here because I'm a mover. Um, and so I'll try to, try to contain myself here. Um, so I come from very humble beginnings. Um, I am, I was born and raised in Merced, California, Central Valley. Any Central California folks here? I know I met one yesterday and I'm going to tell a little bit of a story about that, Stacy, wherever you are. Um, um, Merced, California, and uh, friends used to joke, uh, you know, gosh, if you blink, <laughs> you'll miss Merced. Um, but that's not true because Merced now has the university um, there, University of Merced, Cal at Merced Cal University of California at Merced. And in the nine or ten years that it's now been there, you've seen, just like with um, Boise, the growth that happens with that, and especially with the university town. So I'm the youngest of five children. Um, we're literally stair steps in age. So from 1960 to 1966, my mother had five kids. Six years, five kids. Talk about barefoot and pregnant, right? <laughs> popping out babies. Just popping us out, just one after the other after the other. I was like, Mom, like, what was your diaper budget, you know? 
Um, but here's, here's what's interesting. My mother was 21 when she had me. I'm the youngest of five, and my mother was 21 when she had me. You can do the math. She dropped out of high school. She later went back and got her GED. With the support of my father, her mother and mother and father-in-law, she went back to college. She received her degree. My mother, I'm about to cry. My mother is truly my hero. My father was a laborer. He was a gifted mechanic. He was one of my mother's biggest supporters and then became one of my biggest supporters. My mother was a stay-at-home mom, and she made sure that home was taken care of, her education was, was cared for. My father would come home in time for, from his work so that my mother could get to her classes um, when she needed to. And when that didn't happen, there was a, a grandparent typically um, in the mix there. So my parents were children raising children. They worked together. They made compromises. They never, or somebody, we never went without. I'm sure there were great sacrifices in there, obviously. You have teenagers raising babies, so babies raising babies. And I know that those, those sacrifices um, exist. And I know that it wasn't easy, but at the same time, their parents supported them, but taught them to fish. They didn't give them the fish, they taught them how to fish and provide and survive on their own. So they were a statistic, and the odds were against them, I know. Young, black, teenage parents. Once I went to school, my mom secured her first full-time job with the federal government, which was great. So four of, us, four of us five kids were very active. We were very academic and athletic, and both were values in my home. I never remember a, an event without one of my parents there. I never remember um, whether I was playing volleyball or basketball or high jumping or a debate team or whatever I was at, I never remember a parent not being there. So much so that my father got so involved and so excited about what you were doing, he often would get kicked out of places. <laughs> he was so loud. True story. True story. Um, we had to work very hard at my grandparents. Um, they had a farm. They had cows. They had pigs. They had um, chickens, you name it, if you wanted something to eat, my grandmother would say, baby, what do you want for breakfast? And I'd say, oh, just bacon and eggs. The bacon came from the pigs that they raised, and you had to go out to the chicken coop to get the eggs. Fresh, warm, brown eggs. Um, we assisted other family members, and so even though my parents were building they also helped others come behind. So whether somebody was coming out of the military or some bodies, because it was many, was coming out of the military and they were helping either fix up a house on the property um, next to a grandparent or uncle or staying with us um, um, for periods of time, um, somebody, they had a place to eat and they had a place to um, sleep and they had a safe environment, they had a comfortable, and they had a very clean, my mother was OCD, environment. Um, they helped folks that were dealing with mental illness, whether they were coming back from the military and they were suffering with PTSD or whatever. In one case, in fact, um, there was a family friend that was, um, or actually a, a relative that was divorcing and the mother just wasn't faring well with all the change and literally abandoned the kids, one in particular, and he came to live with us um, throughout, throughout high school. If I wanted a bike, I couldn't just get a bike normal like any kid. I had to uh, go through the initiation of my father and saying, you want a bike? You need to take care of it. So let's get your sibling's bike, let's take it apart, let's put the chain on, let's oil the chain, let's change the tire, let's, um, I mean, it's like, could it not can I just not get a bike like normal people, right? <laughs> when I got my first car, he says, okay, you need to learn how to change the oil, change the spark plugs, and change the tire. Have any of you ever changed the spark plug? Okay, oh! 
but you don't today, do you? <laughs> you do, okay, one over here. All right, change the oil. This is good, okay. Okay, they were also hunters, right? And so they hunted, they, you know, the opening of deer season, he grew the beer out, beer it out, the whole bit. Let me tell you what I'm telling you now is not a traditional or normal like black person thing, right? It's like, really, black people do that? Yeah, we do. We do, because we had bear meat, we had deer meat, we had pheasant, we had, you know, chucker, you name it, we had it. That was in the, the refrigerator um, as well. So I wanted to share that with you because I wanted to give you a perspective of sometimes when you look at a person, you don't always know from where they come. And the other reason I share that is it's a level of trust. Be be between these walls, we have now just built uh, some level of trust. I'll, obviously, I haven't spoken with all of you, but the vulnerability that I have and the ability to share that is a lot. It takes a lot sometimes, right? Because you can cast judgment in, in many different ways. And so, um, so I want to tell you something that happened to me when I was coming um, to Boise the other day. And it kind of hurt my heart a little bit, so much so that what I was going to be talking to you about today had slides and different things and a lot of numbers and exciting stuff, but it changed my heart in the sense of, you know, when we talk about what we want to do and what we're doing in the corporate environment and building a board of directors, a very diverse board of directors, which is phenomenal, 42% women, 30% uh, US minorities, over 50% total minorities on a board of directors, which by the way is double any other tech company in the Silicon Valley. Phenomenal work. <laughs> and, and you'll always hear me say, but we have more to do, and we do. But here's what happened to me um, yesterday. And it was one of those things that I thought, you know what? And it's not the first time, and I'm sure it won't be the last time. I was um, board boarding a Southwest Air flight to come to Boise. Um, there's limited flights to Boise that are nonstop, and it's between Alaska Air and I think Southwest. I chose Southwest for time. I happened to be, when I did my great early check-in, um, A1, which means you're boarding pretty close to first, right? Um, and, but I also was bringing stuff with me, and so I checked a bag, I checked two bags, and as I was running to, um, to check in, um, I kind of slipped in because they had already started, started boarding the A's, and so probably about 15 or 20 or so people had already boarded ahead of me. Not a problem, no one complained, I'm A1, not a problem. And the, the, the attendant said to me, he says, like, you were supposed to board a long time ago. I said, I know, no problem. So I get on the, I get on the plane, and I'm six feet tall with 35-inch um, inseam. I need space. So I go to sit up front in the bulkhead. So it's, it's bulkhead or it's exit or it's cramp for the hour and 20 minutes, right? So a, a, a woman was sitting next to the, um, to the window, and, um, and so I went to sit in the aisle seat, which is my preferred seat anyway. And she said, no, you can't sit there. And I said, okay, is anyone sitting in the middle? And she said, you can't sit there either. And I said, okay. Now, I'm gonna tell you, pause. I did have on a t-shirt that said, be good to people. No lie, it's that'd be good to people. And so I grabbed my computer bag, I walked back down the aisle, got a seat in exit row, was comfortable, not a problem. We go to take off, I look, no daughter, no granddaughter sitting there. And it hurt my heart. It hurt. It was a feeling of rejection. She and the thing is, is it wasn't, it wasn't that she said it, it was how she said it that really, really hurt my heart. And so, you know, I was thinking about that and I started thinking about 
Starbucks and two young African-American men sitting in the, um, in the waiting room waiting for somebody to talk about a business deal that they have and probably very excited and very passionate about what they were about to present and hopefully getting funding and, and whatnot. And a Starbucks um, barista basically calling the police on him, getting him arrested. And I think you guys probably know the rest of the story. I see he has nodding, right? Starbucks lost millions of dollars in that move and closed down the shop for a day to have diversity training, which equates to millions of dollars in productivity loss. Diversity has an economic value to it. It really does. And the other thing is, it would have been so simple to be kind to the customer. And the other thing is, is while I was preparing for this, I, I went down before lunchtime, I grabbed a coffee. It was the first time I had been to Starbucks in one year as a result of that. Diversity matters. So let me talk to you a little bit about going off to college, coming to Boise. I was so excited. I loved the community that I grew up in. I was fortunate to grow up in a family of everythingness. Um, very, I mean, although I, was, I came from a Christian-based home, we had Muslims, we had Buddhists, we had everything um, kind of uh, whether, you know, at the family reunion. And so you, we acknowledged that food and the, the traditions, you know, of, of those, of the different religions. We had, um, I had a cousin that um, was, uh, was an amputee at a very young age, which was, an, which, which was unfortunate. Um, his mother was a welfare recipient. He had an injury, went to the emergency room and was told, first of all, waited eight hours. And then when he was finally seen, was told to go home, he'd be okay. Got gangrene and he lost his leg. He was a, he was a future scholarship athlete. So um, uh, of course it was a lawsuit, uh, malpractice and all of those things. But my cousin is a phenomenal man, one of the best people I know. And so the fact that you're standing before somebody that's an amputee, you can't not not notice that part of his leg is missing. And so for me, in the way that I grew up, you just asked what you wanted to know. And I'll never forget when my daughter was about three or four, he came to Boise to visit us with, uh, with my brother. And my daughter just stood there and just stared at him and stared at him. And so I said to her, I said, sweetie, I said, do you have a question for Cousin Joe? And she said, no. And I said, you could ask him. I said, Joe, is it OK if she asks what she's, whatever it is that's going on in this three-year-old head, you know? And so he said, yes, please do ask. And so she said, what do you do with your other shoe? <laughs> Who knew, right? Who knew? Who knew? So, so because I grew up with so much diversity in my own family, I know nothing else. Did we use incorrect vernac vernacular? Absolutely. Did we tease? Absolutely. Did we cast judgment or buy? Absolutely, we did all those things. I think we all do. But the opportunity that we have today is when we know better, we need to do better. The opportunity also that we have today is when you're at conferences like this, and I just commend Tracy, and I said this to her, I said, Tracy, you're carrying on your father's legacy. Part of the reason I stayed in, in, in Idaho was because Governor Andrus made it a better place for people like me that were different, that stood out. And so I thank you so much, so much from the bottom of my heart, Tracy. I'm getting teary-eyed again. Oh my goodness. <laughs> But so, and the other thing I often say too is, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to be my little precious girl that just wanted to know what, what's the other shoe? What do you do with it? And ask, let's not make up stories. Let's let them ask the real stories. Let's ask permission. Let's build trust and be able to share with one another. 
So when I came off to college, I am a product of the Equal Opportunity in Education Act. Much of us, many of us know that as Title IX. And um, the intent of that, the purpose of that is, is the law to eliminate discrimination on the basis of gender in public or, excuse me, public or private schools that receive federal funds. It's the basics. So I earned a four-year women's um, basketball scholarship. Um, I played two of my four years, and I would probably say, and I have a few of my old teammates here, that I probably came with a little, I didn't come with an attitude. I developed a little bit of an attitude because of, of the coach that I had. He just was a, a male coach that had only coached men and was transitioning to, with women and didn't know that you don't interact in the way that he was interacting with women. And, didn't know how to motivate this young, black, 18-year-old girl that just liked to play basketball, loved to play, and loved to be around the, the camaraderie of the sisterhood and the social aspect of it. But I knew very clearly, and I had cousins that have gone off and played in the NFL and the NBA and have gone and got master's degrees and, and are uh, lawyers and doctors and dentists and all of those different things but he didn't know how to deal with this young black girl. And he didn't know that I had a father in my home that taught me how to change a tire and oil and change the oil and that that built confidence up in me. He didn't know that my father told me almost every single day, you know, you are so precious with your cute little self, but you're also tough and you can do anything you want to do. And so for somebody to then take me and then try to pull me down and degrade me and demean me and to kind of get me under his thumb, it was a challenge. And as a result of that, I didn't perform at my best. I don't even think I did school academics at my best because all of these things were going on. And so when I, when I, when, when my second year ended, I was just like, peace out. Mr. and I won't fill in the name, um, and Cindy, don't you either. <laughs> She's sitting back over there. But I'll tell you what happened to me, which was great, is one day I was walking through the student, uh, student administration building, and there was this woman, a little woman that had had polio and walked with a slight limp. Her name was Margie Van Voren. Her husband, by the way, worked for um, BLM for many years and retired Al Van Voren. And Margie walked up behind me and just kind of went Doop! and kind of came up behind me and made me jump a little bit and startled me. She says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for a way to like, finish school. All I know is my dad said, one, I begged to come home the first year and cried. And he said, no, you're, you're going to do this. We, it was the teaching me how to fish thing. And, um, and two, you better come home with a degree. I don't care what the degree is, but you better have a degree. Um, and so I told her, I says, I'm trying to figure out a way to f finance my school. I know I'm not going to do the student loan thing, and um, I don't, I just don't know how, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And so she said, you know what, come back on Thursday and, and let's have a, a, a talk. I'm going to put you on my, on my calendar. And so I went off, and I couldn't wait for Thursday to come. And Thursday comes, and the student union, the administration building opens at 8, and at 7.30, I was like, by the door, where is she? When is she coming? She put the key in, and I like bammed through the door, just burst through the door. I sat down with her, and she says, I think I have a role for you. And she started telling me about this position. I was like, wow, that kind of sounds great. It sounds kind of too good to be true, but it helped. It was going to finance. It was going to help me get the money that I needed to you know, to ultimately finish school. So she says, I have a title even for you. And I said, well, what is it? She said, you're going to be the student assistant of the dean of student special services. She was the assistant dean. She said, you're going to be the student assistant. And, um, and I said, OK, and, and how much, you know, and, she, and, and I forgot what it was. But basically, it was the highest paid student position on campus at the time. And I said, yes, I scored, right? So. I did that, but it's a full circle moment because in that program, I also did programs for veterans, 
for Latinos, for non-traditional women was the language that we used, for, the, uh, for telecommuters, people commuting in and out the Treasure Valley to come back to school, for people that were dealing with um, um, you know, coming back in and needing to get uh, you know, kind of versed in their math, and, and Black Student Union, and Chicano Student and it was just like, wow and access for people with disabilities. And so I'm like, this is cool. But it's exactly, it just dawned on me, that is exactly the internship of Enrique Lores, now CEO of a Fortune 500 company, well, actually Fortune 200, but Fortune 200 company. I never imagined, never imagined the job Diversity, chief diversity officer didn't exist back then. But doing that work for people like me to be able to impact a beautiful city like this, because I tell you what, I travel a lot, and I'm always trying to get that seat with, for the long legs, by the way. Um, and I represent Boise. I represent Boise State. And I mean, like, do I not represent Boise State here? <laughs> Really? <laughs> but really, companies like Micron, companies like HP and other tech companies, we're focused on innovation. Innovation comes through diversity. It comes through, and we pull talent from, um, from the schools, from, from the engineering program, from the business schools, from the marketing schools. And so whether it's U of I, Idaho State, Boise State, we have a place here and we need that diverse talent in order for us to be the best and to compete not only locally but also globally. So that's important. My story is probably many, I'm sure all of you guys might have a, a very similar story. But for two very young parents, kids raising kids, I don't think they did so bad, right? right? All right, so I want to give you a couple takeaways, and I see my yellow card flash at me, and I'm ready. Um, number one, a statistic is not a story. A statistic is not a story. My parents were a statistic. There's often judgment formed, biases, when you look at things at face value, if you look at it at a glance. It's when people are less, when, I'm sorry, it's when when we think people are less than we are, or more importantly, you think you're better than they are, and you've never taken the time to hear their story, you'll write them off. And so what I would submit for you today is to take the time to hear the story. We did a beautiful exercise Trina led yesterday. It was a two minute exercise, and it was connect with somebody, sit down with them, two minutes, hear their story, and in that two minutes, all she wanted was three things that you had in common. The person that I, I, I sat down with, here's what I'm gonna tell off on Stacy. Um, Stacy, are you? Oh, I see you. Stacy came over, she introduced herself to me, and the first thing she said was, if you don't mind me sharing this, I guess I should ask. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Um, she said to me, she said, I'm so nervous when I do this kind of work and have to have these like kind of conversations. And I said, well, just tell me about yourself. And she said, I grew up, I didn't grow up here. I said, oh, I didn't either. Where'd you grow up? She said, the Central Valley in California. I said, I did too. So there were three things right there. And so we just kept building. I said, oh, me too. And we just, and so we just immediately connected. Now, had you looked at me and you looked at her and you put us together, you probably would think there are so many differences. But yet there were so many similarities. So remember, let's not get caught up in the statistics. It's not the story. The story are, is our own to share. And I'm so thankful, like you, Tracy, that I, have, um, I'm, I feel like I'm living my father's legacy because that is who he was, is to get to know people. The second is kindness. And I saw this beautiful campaign come out yesterday with fifth graders, and it was simple, kindness. It starts with hello. And had that woman on that plane said to me, hello, I'm really saving this seat for my daughter or my granddaughter, I would have been no problem. I was no problem anyway. But I would have been no problem. I would have went and sat down, and I would have felt OK. She made me feel icky. She made me feel unwanted. 
And I'm a fearless black woman too, by the way. But she made me feel like crap, like, you know. And, and, and when you think about the stereotypes that our wonderful state already has, you can't do stuff like that. Let's start with kindness, let's be kind. Not only be kind to others, but be kind to yourself. Women, we're good. We're confident, we're okay. Let's be kind to ourselves and let's be kind to other women. And, and, and let's pave the way, let's open the doors for other. There's so much room, there's so much space for all of us to thrive. And then the last is, let's be the hero of our own story. Let's stop forcing people to live to the expectations of others as parents. Um, and let's assist them with finding their purpose, finding their passion, living their passion and igniting in them the ability and the tools to persevere because things will happen, life will knock you on your butt. You will lose fathers, you will lose brothers, siblings, um, you will lose pets, you'll, I mean, things will happen. You will find out your child is of a different sexual orientation. Things will knock you on your butt, and you've got to, and we've got to be prepared for that. Millennials are dealing with high level, of, high, high, high levels of anxiety. Suicide rates are climbing. We suffer losses, mass shootings. Oh my goodness! Please, right? So I want to end on this note, and it's very simple, and that is: let's be, in, let's be intentionally inclusive in everything that we do, because after all, inclusion starts with I. Thank you. Now, I suspect that we're going to have a whole lot of questions coming up from the audience. Oh, I'm sorry, we should have gotten to some. So, so Walt, if you've got a question, hold up your card, bring them up to me. The, some of our volunteers will bring them up to me. So, yes. what's the one thing that you think our businesses in Idaho can do to welcome a more inclusive environment? I love that question, and boy, do I have an answer for you. I think... Um, I think, first of all, we have to stop talking about it, and we have to, have to start doing it. We have to start doing it. Imagine, Tracy, if every single person sitting here at this table, and I see it's, it's not, I mean, it's great to see the men, it's great to see the women. I, I, are there veterans in the house? Great, we've got a few veterans, people with disabilities. Thank you, you guys, for your support of our country, for our service people with disabilities, imagine if we all brought one person that was different than us next year, you're gonna have to get a new place, right? That's just what you wanted to hear, right? <laughs> but, so it starts there, and then you have to build an infrastructure, and you have to build an eco ecosystem to welcome that in. So the infrastructure is built around putting together very specific goals. In our case, it was let's start with the board, let's get our people and our culture because that's what's strong and that's what HP is known for. Let's get these two to come together and then let's build an ecosystem so that we can get and we can keep folks. And we have to be kind, we have to be kind to people. I'm not surprised to see this question. I don't, I'm sure you probably are aware that when our new president came to Boise State, one of the first things that she was confronted with was that we had some legislators that felt by having inclusion programs that were specific to different groups that we were violating the overall diversity issue. What's your response? Well, you wouldn't have me, right? Um, if, if, we weren't, if we weren't focused on diversity in some way, um, we wouldn't have, um, one, we wouldn't have a great talent pool, but here's what's interesting about, about that, is that diversity is, and, and I think most of us in our hearts probably say we're good people, we're kind people, we value. So it's a, there's a values issue to it, but then there's also the business imperative. 
The business imperative is about bottom line results. It's about shareholder value. And so if you want to grow your business, if you want to grow innovation, if you want creativity, you have to have diversity. You have to. And so we've got to figure out a way to build this narrative so that people understand that there's value in both. And it's not about a right or a left. It's about humanity. So how on campus do separate individual clubs, the, the black club, the LGBTQ club, the veterans uh, club, how do these clubs where they're inviting in specific groups collectively create diversity? Well, I think that, I think that, and, and, and I'll use myself as an example, um, our business impact networks that we have, or clubs on, on, uh, on uh, college campuses, we align ourselves to a business objective. And so ours is about core growth future. In the case of a university, and, a, and, and especially a thriving university like Boise State University, I think clubs need to be a little bit more open, but people need to also understand the reason we want those clubs is because we're looking for our community. We're looking for our people. We're looking for a safety net. We're looking for people that surround us, that understand our plight, that understand the culture, um, and can and can embrace that with us and for us. And so I think that there's it's coming together, having those courageous conversations to be able to have a better understanding. This person at 18 walking around like when my coach told me something and I put my hand on my hip is a very different person today. But it was because I didn't have, and I was looking for and searching for, and honestly didn't have the language to deal with this man that had never dealt with someone like me. And when he did, there were three of us, <laughs> and he put us off to the side. And so none of us flourished in this environment as a result of that. I flourished because I had people, I had um, community leaders, I had boosters, I had Margie Van Voren that loved me, cared for me, and really wanted to see me succeed. What are the actions that you and HP took that were successful in diversifying your board? First and foremost, um, wonderful question. When you are going to diversify, you have to be intentional. First rule of thumb is, we are we're comfortable doing what we're comfortable knowing and so therefore you will get what you always got if you keep doing the same thing we know that's insanity so you have to be very very intentional about going out and saying and by the way it takes saying no many times and our leaders will say we said no we said no you're using a um, a search firm that is bringing in the same, and by the way, in the tech industry, white male dominant. We're not trying to eliminate white men, we're trying to bring in others. And so when you're trying to build a board, you're, gonna build, you're, you're building and they're pulling from that same talent pool because that's who are CEOs and you know, they've already, they're already out there. So you have to be able to take a chance on looking at new and different talent. And by the way, it's not all about race, it's not all about ethnicity and gender, it's about perspective of bringing somebody in that maybe has started a new business or has an expertise in software. And um, one of our board members started as a COO of TaskRabbit. She was under 40 when she joined our board. Today she is the CEO and sold it to Ikea. And so she's bad mamma jamma. So that's what you want. You want to be able to look for that, um, whether it's feistiness, it's fearlessness, it's all of those things in order to bring it in that's different than what you're doing. How do you grapple with your own biases and discriminations? First of all, I laugh. And I, I typically will say, um, and, and Trina knows this from my staff, I'm like, you know what, here's what I think about something. And I'm like, but I want, and you're, any of you are willing to challenge me on this or open me up to a different way of thinking. When there were some things that were going on from a political standpoint, I mean, I start with humanity, and I just said, I really want somebody that has a different perspective than I do to enlighten me. We do work at HP around growth mindset, and I know it's a buzzword and everything, but what 
what growth mindset does is it opens you up to a different way of thinking. It opens you up to an inclusive leadership way. You ask questions differently to warrant different conversation. And more importantly than that, it builds a different level of trust where you can have those conversations and I have them all the time. Somebody can call me out and I'm okay with that. You have to be willing to ask for the feedback in order to get the feedback. Can you give us some suggestions on how to, well, this goes back to the legislature, um, on how to manage. You guys just political questions on yeah, no, Well, no, it's, it's <laughs> actually back to the diversity issue with Boise State and, and what our new um, president had to deal with. Mm -hmm. And, and dealing with the pushba pushback from members of the Idaho legislature to Boise State's diversity work. If you were Boise State and they're telling you, I think your clubs are all wrong, we want, um, we want all students to be treated the same, they can't have independent clubs, what would you say to the legislators? I, I think what I've been saying, I mean, and I think it's clear, it, it, it is that you miss the Leslie Slaytons of the world, um, the James McNortons of the world, you miss the Trina Ponces, you miss phenomenal talent if you don't have those programs because in many cases, we sometimes just don't have access. We don't have knowledge. I, I live and work in the Silicon Valley and I tell you whenever I go in to do a robotics class, a coding class or whatever, you'll see a large number of white boys and Asian boys and girls. And it's like, okay, but where's the brown skin folks? And a lot of times it's because you're not going to their school, you're not giving them um, awareness of, and I'll, if I can just, if I may, as a result of that, we've seen a dip over 30 years and a decline with minorities in technology as a result of, of not having those programs. And so we're rebuilding right now, so much so that I went out and co-founded my own organization called Curated Pathways to Innovation, and it's merely based on cradle to career, let's get girls an opportunity and let's get minorities an opportunity to have access, to have understanding and awareness of what's happening so that they can too be selected for AP courses, advanced placement courses, and go to the great competitive schools. Plain and simple, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an app and then it's a collective impact model where we partner government, we, pro we partner nonprofit, corporate together in, in uh, school districts in order to give these students access. So as you increased awareness and action around diversity and inclusion at HP, what did you say, what did you do and say to combat feelings of exclusion from some of the majority groups? Or in other words, what did you say to the white man that was threatened by your efforts? I love that question. I love white men. <laughs> <laughs> They're my friends. Um, no, um, very sir, I'm, 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 I'm not playing. I do have, I do have white friends. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting because what, what we typically start with, what I start with is data. And as I talked about, the, the statistics is not the story, nor is the data. But the data does tell a good story of what's happening from a demographic standpoint within, within the tech industry in particular. And so for me, it is, and one by one in some cases, building the relationship and again, trust to understand that if you want to grow your business, and by the way, that's what you're here for at the end of the day, the culture for us, it's kind of HP's secret sauce, if you will, um, and so we still work on strengthening it. But if you want those things for your business, then let's come together and let's, let's look at how we can have these conversations with the men on the team and, and start creating allyship so that they understand that there's no fear in losing your job. We're not pushing people out of, of, of the company. We're just trying to welcome new people in and create an environment and a culture in which everybody can come and thrive. Whether you're LGBTQ, whether you're uh, you know, a person of, of African descent or black or Latino or native or, and you can bring that beautiful culture with you. And so we're just trying to do more around those partnerships and having those real conversations about it more than anything. And a good question to end on, what is the one thing you want to change at HP that you haven't been able to do yet? 
Woo-wee! That is a loaded one. It's myself. It's hard. It's hard to be in an environment when you know that you're doing good for the whole and there's resistance. And so sometimes I really, really question, am I the right person that's trying to make this happen and to do this? Because it's everything. I'm often asked the question of what keeps you up at night? And I'm like, don't ask me that. Ask me what wakes me up in the morning. And it's because I have something new for the workplace. And so it's myself. Well, we think you're pretty terrific. Thank you.